If you are struggling to stay organized, to find information in your business, to answer all your team members' questions, to seamlessly and joyfully delegate work, I encourage you to check out the Done For You Free Time Operations Dashboard. This is an exact replica of what I've discovered over two years of building out business systems through Notion, the software that powers my entire business and delightfully tiny team that has eliminated the need for docs, sheets, Airtables, Evernote, Asana, you name it, it's all together in one place and I have built this for you. So it is time to stop Frankenstringing your software and services together and move over to the done for you free time operations dashboard. You can learn more at itsfreetime.com slash dashboard. And as a special thank you for being here, podcast listeners get 10% off. Enter promo code podcast at checkout. That's itsfreetime.com slash dashboard. Enter promo code podcast at checkout. Your best clients will support you. And the clients who don't are the clients who you don't want anyway. And what's amazing is when you change your pricing, even if you lose a few clients, you will still be making more money than you did previously at your lower price points working with more clients. And now you've also just opened up space to attract these new ideal clients who will happily pay you the prices that you need to charge in order for you to be profitable. This is your time. How can we earn twice as much in half the time with joy and ease while serving the highest good? That is our guiding question here at the Free Time Cafe, your home for heart-based business. I'm your host, Jenny Blake. Join me for conversations with authors, friends, and fellow business owners as we explore ways to free your mind, time, and team to do your best work. Now, on to today's show. Welcome back, my friends. I am so excited for today's guest, Erin Haig. I jumped out of my chair when mutual friend Alexander Franzen wrote a newsletter to her list, and just the title of Erin's forthcoming book alone had me say, yes, we need this on free time. She is writing a book that we'll have updates on after this interview airs in terms of how it will make its way into the world. It's called Give Yourself a Raise, the mindset and math you need to get to your first million. Erin is the creator of Pricing Overhaul and a self-proclaimed math nerd. Using over 20 years of corporate experience working intimately with numbers and pricing, she created Pricing Overhaul to help people shift their mindset around money and math overhaul pricing for profitability, and make more money inside their business than they ever dreamed possible. Her book is her story of hitting rock bottom and then pushing to overhaul her entire business, primarily through the lens of pricing. Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me and what a lovely introduction. You were running a Pilates studio. So brick and mortar, I feel, is its own beast in terms of getting the math to work. Can you take us to the moment when you realized that the way you were pricing was actually making you sick, like your body started to fight back? I'll take you back to 2009 when I was laid off from my corporate sales job. I had spent years working in corporate America, making millions and millions of dollars for other people, primarily men. And um, I was laid off during the recession for obvious reasons. And I just decided in that moment that the only true job security was to become my own boss and open my own studio or my own business, I should say. And so I decided to open a Pilates and yoga studio. And of course, like any newbie business owner would do, I did what I thought was market research. And I simply looked at what everybody else was doing in my market, what they were charging, and I copied their model. So five years into my business, I am gaining popularity. The studio is growing. More and more clients are coming in. I'm growing my team. And my revenue was increasing consistently month over month and year over year. But I, Erin Haig, was not making any more money personally than I did when I first opened the studio. Then 
I landed in the hospital with viral meningitis. And the neurologist came into the room and basically explained that I developed meningitis, the infection that I had in my body crossed the blood-brain barrier simply because my body was so stressed and it couldn't bite this virus. And so it crossed the blood-brain barrier and there you have it, viral meningitis. And as this neurologist is saying this to me, I'm thinking this person's crazy. I'm like, I'm not stressed. What are you talking about? And then he looked at me and he was like, so you have two babies under the age of two, you own a business, and you still haven't fully recovered from the infection that you had last month. And the month prior, I had been admitted to the same hospital because I had a kidney stone that turned into a kidney infection. So needless to say, it was this moment where I was like, okay, Something has got to give in my business. I can't continue to go on this way. And as I was there on bed rest for several weeks, I did a lot of thinking about what had gone wrong in my business. Like, how did I get into such a state of distress? And ultimately, when I analyzed my business every which way, it all came down to pricing. The truth was, I just wasn't pricing my services for profitability. And no matter how many clients came in the door, no matter how much revenue my business was generating at the end of the month and at the end of the year, there was nothing left over. And I was literally one bad month away from having to close my doors. And it was in that moment that I had to, you know, get real with the numbers. And I had to dig in and do all the calculations and figure out exactly how much I had to charge in order to make this business not only continue to remain open, but to remain open and profitable. And it was very uncomfortable, like extremely uncomfortable because I had to come face to face with all of these business killing, profit killing decisions that I had made when I was building this business. And I had to be the one to step out of the so-called industry norm and start charging the prices that I had to charge and start collecting payments in a way that was completely different than anybody else in the industry was doing. And once I did that and made that change, literally everything changed for my business. And three years later, I was able to sell my cash positive business for 40 times my original investment. I had no debt on the business. And I was able to take all of the proceeds from the sale, 100%, and put it into my pocket. And it was in that moment that I was like, the answer to every business owner's problem is literally just changing their pricing. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for sharing your story. It's incredible you were able to exit at a 40x multiple. I mean, that's wild. Such an accomplishment and so rare, again, especially for brick and mortar. Why do you think so many business owners, myself included over the years, are so afraid of pricing? And in fact, we are willing to drive our bodies into the ground to where a doctor has to tell you you're stressed or have the business be on the brink of collapse before we're willing to raise our prices. For most listeners, none of us have the problem of overcharging. So why is it that we go so extreme in the other direction? For one, the math can be intimidating. And when you open a business, unless you have gone to business school and have an MBA, you never really learn how to do the proper calculations to bake in the things that you have to bake in into your pricing, all of your operating expenses, all of your payroll expenses, your tax liabilities, your owner's pay. And then once you know what your break even is, then you have to bake in a profit. And for one, I think the math is just intimidating for people initially. I think Another factor is that as human beings, especially when we open up a business, our businesses become our so-called babies. 
And we wrap so much of our emotion into our businesses, how well our businesses are doing. And if we price or if we feel as though we price our services too high and we have fear that clients won't pay those higher prices, then what does that say about us as human beings? Because we've tied so much of our self-worth into the success and health of our businesses. I just think that we have this false belief that we have to fit into industry norms and industry standards. So we open up a business in whatever industry it is, and we do what we think is market research, and we look at everybody else, and we just assume that they are smarter, better, more qualified than we are. And if this is what they're charging, well, they must have done the math. So I'm just going to copy what they did. Truth is, your competitors did not do the math. Your competitors did pretty much what you did. They opened up a business and they copied their competitors who copied their competitors who copied theirs. And you can see how then this becomes this vicious cycle of undercharging and under earning. I love the permission slip. You can charge more than your competitors. And you give us another permission slip. You can also charge more than what you personally can afford. I think that's kind of mind blowing for some people. I told this story in the book about how when I opened up my studio, my first brick and mortar business, I was 27 years old. Okay. At 27, my pockets were a pretty shadow, right? I had no money. And I wasn't charging the prices that I needed to be charging simply because I was like, well, nobody can afford to pay that much for Pilates. I certainly couldn't. Well, no. Of course I couldn't because I was charging too little in my business and I wasn't making enough money in order to be able to afford those services. So you have to remember that when pricing your services, one, you have to price it based on what the math tells you, but two, you are not your client. You do not have the same pocketbook that your client might have. And if you continue to charge only the prices that you personally can charge at this moment in time, You will never be able to afford the higher prices. You have to charge more in order to earn more. And then one day, like now, 41-year-old Aaron, I can easily afford the prices that I had to charge back when I had my Pilates studio because now I'm making enough money to be able to afford that. It's so important, just as you say, doing the math and not just pricing to get by. I think a lot of people also, they might think, oh, I'm doing the math, but you're doing math that gets you scraping by, living paycheck to paycheck, essentially, even as the owner of the business, where the owner is kind of eking out the leftovers. And what you're describing is pricing abundantly. And you're right that it takes a lot of courage to break free from what everyone else is charging, or even an industry norm like Pilates, where Every other studio, if 95% of studios are charging this way, class packages, for example, but you want to create a subscription service, is there a reason that you're the only one that wants to do that? Is there something wrong with this? Is this not going to work? I can just see all the mental chatter that would get in the way of going against the grain. Oh, for sure. And it is one of the biggest obstacles that I work on with my clients when I begin working with them because we have to shift your mindset first. And that's actually before I even go into the math, we spend a lot of time shifting your mindset around what you can and cannot do. And ultimately, it comes down to you do not have to charge what your competitors are charging. You absolutely can and should charge more. You are not your client, so you shouldn't charge only based on what you think that your clients can afford because that's how much you can afford. There are like so many things that we go through just to shift the mindset before we even get to the map. One of the other major obstacles for a lot of people is the fear of losing business. That if they raise their prices, either people will stop coming in the doors, maybe their demand will decrease, and actually then they'll be earning less. 
or they're afraid to upset their best clients. And you also address this very directly in the book that you can increase your prices without upsetting your best clients. I think people are really afraid to do this. And I myself have often grandfathered in or grandparented in, if we're going to be gender neutral, older clients because I didn't want to have that conversation. I didn't want to raise their rates. Meanwhile, when service providers raise their rates to me today, I am happy for them. Just like you say in the book, I think to myself, good on you. You're providing an amazing service and I'll meet you there. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the biggest fears. And I've created this rollout strategy that I'll walk my clients through to help them actually get through this. And what we find is that, just like you said, your clients want you to do well, because if you're not doing well, and your business isn't doing well, that they're no longer going to be able to receive your services. And the services that you provide to them are valuable. And so it's easier for a client to simply pay you more in order to help you run a profitable business than it is for them to have to find somebody new to provide whatever service you're providing. I look at my hairstylist and I have basically followed her all over the county because it doesn't matter where she's doing hair or what salon she's moving to. I want her to always do my hair. And when she raises her prices, I'm like, absolutely, because I don't want to have to go to somebody else who then has to take however long, six months to a year to figure out what to do with my hair. Your best clients will support you. And the clients who don't are the clients who you don't want anyway. And what's amazing is when you change your pricing, even if you lose a few clients, you will still be making more money than you did previously at your lower price points working with more clients. And now you've also just opened up space to attract these new ideal clients who will happily pay you the prices that you need to charge in order for you to be profitable. We'll be right back just after this. As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy, available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Can you take us back to the Pilates studio? The business is on the brink of collapse. What was the specific change that you made and how did your clients take it at that time? I was on class packs like everybody else. The concept of clients buy 10 or 20 sessions at a time. And then they take their time to redeem those sessions. And it was also priced very similarly with the other studios in my area. So the first thing I did was I increased my prices by 35% because that's what the math told me I had to do. But not only did I increase by 35%, But I also got rid of the class box and I moved everybody on to a recurring membership model. So my clients could commit to a certain number of sessions within a month. And the more sessions they took over the month, all the higher their client utilization was for my business, the less they were paying per session. Then I also layered in another incentive. I offered memberships in increments of month to month, six month, and 12 month agreements. And the longer a client committed to my studio, the less they paid per session. So I built in this recurring revenue membership model, subscription model, and I incentivized clients who increased their frequency with which they took their sessions and the length of their commitment to my studio. This was completely different than any other studio in my area. Now, of course, I did leave one class cap option. So if somebody did not want to commit to a membership, sure, I understand, but they paid a premium, a much higher price point for that five pack of classes 
than they would if they simply committed to a monthly auto pay. It took me, I'm going to say, three months to transition a good majority, about 90% of my clients onto this new membership. It took me, I would say, a full six months, maybe even to a year to get all the stragglers. Because seriously, the day before I rolled out these prices, I sold a 20 pack of private sessions and it took that client like a year to redeem that 20 pack. But my clients were very receptive, very understanding. I also think coming off the heels of viral meningitis helped a little bit in that transition. I maybe lost three clients out of 156. All in all, it was better for my clients too because they were now committed to the studio, which meant that they were coming more regularly, which meant that they were getting better results. It was a win-win for everybody. I love hearing that they were more committed too because often we think of pricing as a zero-sum game. If we price more, somehow it's a loss for the client, but actually everybody can win. And you and I both know that, that sometimes investing in a coach, the more you pay for the coach, at least for me, the more I show up because the more it hurts, then it really hurts if you don't use those services. Absolutely. And what it did was it made people, it made my clients make their Pilates practice a priority where before it was kind of just like flip it, right? If they went out of town or they were sick or they couldn't come one day, they would just cancel their session and there was no reason for them to have to make up that session. But now that we were on this membership model and they received X number of sessions every single month, they needed to use those sessions or they lost them. And so even if somebody had to miss a class or they were out for a week because of vacation or whatever, they made up those sessions, which meant that they had more Pilates in their body more regularly. As any owner of a Pilates studio will tell you, the more you have Pilates in your body, the better your body becomes. Yeah, for sure. I love Pilates. I always tell people I hated it for the first year, but I always felt better after class. I just hated it while I was in class, even though I had done yoga for a long time. I loved it. And then I turned a corner and now it's a staple and it has been for the last many, many years. But I had to get over that hump because it was so hard. There's all these tiny muscles that I didn't even know I had. I remember in my earliest Pilates days, I could not finish a single set in an hour-long class. Like I was always ending every exercise early. But it is such a game changer. So that's our little Pilates PSA. Yes, it is. And I mean, I had a Pilates studio. Now I'm a business coach and consultant, but I work with clients. It's not just exclusive to Pilates. This membership model works for any service-based business. Yes, I'm such a fan of recurring revenue as well. I try to get every stream I have to be recurring. You are really open in the book about different ways to tell clients, current clients, that you're raising rates. And you always say, definitely do it one-on-one. Don't just send a mass blast. But there was a variety in terms of just being really short, sweet, and direct to the last example you give is like full-blown honesty. Listen, if I don't do this, my business is going to collapse, you know? So I don't know. I'm just curious what you've seen clients try over the years and People might be scared to be so honest, but I could also see the benefit of just being really real. Like if a client pushes back, can you give us some of that language of how you would share this news if someone's asking why or resisting a little bit? There's no specific script per se, but I work with each one of my clients individually to like really identify the reason they're starting this pricing overhaul process to begin with. It's that emotional trigger, that hot button that made them realize, oh my goodness, something's got to change and it's got to be my pricing, right? So whatever it is, I encourage my clients to communicate uh, that as openly and honestly and transparently as possible or as they feel comfortable. The truth is, in service-based businesses, our clients have really solid relationships with us. We've developed kind of even personal relationships with our clients. It's just the nature of being a service provider. It's only fair to the client for them to understand 
why you're making these changes and how not only it's going to positively affect you as a service provider, but it's going to positively affect them also. Saying so identifying the why for me, it was I was just in the hospital with viral meningitis. Like, and I was in the hospital with viral meningitis because I became a slave to my business. It made me sick. And I want nothing more than to keep my doors open and to continue providing these services to my clients. But if I continue to charge what I'm charging, I physically can't do that. And so the only way for me to continue to do this is to raise the rates. And when I did the math, this is what the maps told me I had to charge. Now, I worked with a lot of clients post-pandemic, and the conversations were around, we made it through the pandemic, the business survived, but we are barely staying afloat right now. And the business that I had pre-pandemic no longer is going to keep me moving forward. I have to make these changes because we're now living in this post-pandemic world. And for so many of my clients, they have like back rent. They have all of these EIDL loans now. And I have coached my clients to be honest about it. Like I have now taken on an additional upwards of $5,000 a month in expenses because of the pandemic. And I have to adjust my prices in order to be able to cover those expenses and to stay afloat, but not only to stay afloat, I don't even want business owners to barely stay afloat. I want you to thrive and I want you to have a thriving, profitable business. And your clients want that too. Part of that thriving is, as you say, radiating success, confidence, and excellence. You really give us the challenge to rise in terms of how we present ourselves, how we walk into a room, even you give these delightful examples of like buying a nicer bath soap or what you say is the way you treat yourself and the people around you. Everything you do from the biggest action down to the smallest detail must radiate this message. I am excellent at what I do. I am proud of my work. I offer premium services with premium pricing to match. I reach for the best things in life. I don't settle for anything less. Writers giving a second in the background. He's like, hell yeah, girl. <laughs> Can you say more about this? How we show up? Why does that matter? Like radiating this notion of like, I deserve excellence. I am excellent what I do. And I offer premium services with premium pricing. Those might be stretchy shoes for some business owners to step into, even outside of their day to day in the business. One, the reason it's important is because I believe strongly in the law of attraction. And if we are trying to attract the type of client who is willing to pay premium prices for the premium services that we offer, we also have to become that person because we're going to attract who we are. And so I certainly don't want clients hammering over my prices. So that's what I don't do. I don't haggle over prices. I don't want clients to only purchase from me when I'm running a flash sale or I'm offering a discount. So guess what? I buy things that I want to buy when I want to buy them and when I need them. And I'm not somebody who is going to sit here and wait for Black Friday. When I see a service provider of mine who is not paying enough or not charging enough, I am going to tell that person that she is not charging enough and she needs to charge me more because I want to become the client who I want to attract. And so I challenge everyone to do that. And once you start changing the way in which you move through the world, you're going to find that those types of people and clients are just going to show up. It's really amazing. We'll be right back just after this. I'd love to go behind the book on this one, too, because you are working with the oh-so-delightful Alex Franzen. And you even say in the afterword of the book, you say that most people, and I agree with you, so many authors say, writing a book is so hard. It was a horrible slog through torture. And I've finally come out the other side. 
but you actually had quite a delightful and really quick, actually, process. I would love if you could share a little bit of how you decided to work with Alex and her team, what that was like. I know you did a six-week sprint. I just, there are a lot of aspiring authors who listen to the show. And so hearing about your process, anything you want to share would be fascinating. Not Alex at a conference that I attended in April of 2022. She was a keynote speaker and I was immediately drawn to her. And I had this idea that I was going to write a book. It was kind of sitting on the back burner and I never really thought that it was something I could actually do. And like you said, oh, I don't know if I want to go into that. That's going to be miserable, blah, 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 blah. But something just like told me to stock Alex at the coffee station, which I did three mornings in a row. <laughs> and that ended up leading to us having a conversation and her loving this idea for the book and inviting me to work with her to help develop this book. And so I started working with her as my book coach and I set a very aggressive deadline. I don't know if this is possible, but you tell me. My family's going to Africa in June. I would really love to have this book done before we go on safari. And she was like, okay, well, that's a very quick turnaround, but we can do it. And it was so much fun and it was so lovely. Thanks to her, I basically like word vomited all of my thoughts over the course of several hours. And then she put everything together in a beautiful organized outline. She basically outlined my book for me and she saw these are the parts of your book. So we have part one, part two, and part three. And then within these parts, this is how we are going to organize the chapters. She came up with the titles for each chapter, and then she would give me a writing. And she would say, okay, this week, your goal is to write chapters one through three. And I put some writing prompts in there. And I just want you to write as much as you can and submit it to me at the end of the week through chapter three. So I was like, I'm going to make this so much fun. So when my daughters were at gymnastics, I would take myself to a restaurant. I would get a couple glasses of wine. I'd get some yummy food and I would just write away. Or I would lay in my bath day and on my iPhone in my Google Doc, typing away for like an hour at night in my bath or sitting outside in my backyard. I just like Every day I carved out time in an environment that made me feel like this premium person. I would even take myself to the O Palm Beach Resort and Spa, which my husband, every time I said I was going, rolled his eyes. But I would literally put on my robe, my slippers. I was there at the O Palm Beach with my champagne and my cupcakes, type and roll this stuff. And we did it in six weeks and it was delightful and it was fun. I mean, if you're going to write a book, I suggest you pair book writing with wine, cheese, and cupcake tasting. That's just the way that I prefer to write a book now. Oh, that is so joyful. And I love how you said that you really wanted to put yourself in environments that lifted your spirits and made you feel premium, just as the message of the book is. Do you think it also, those six weeks went, I mean, I love that she gave you prompts, gave you accountability, gave you encouragement, gave you an outline, or at least helped you pull this out of what's already in you. Do you think it also went quickly because it was already in your head? Like you already have IP around this and in a way you just had to get the story. You already have lived your story. You already had pricing overhaul. I wonder if that also made it quicker that you weren't inventing things as you went. You just needed to explain them to a reader. My book is basically everything that I say to my clients on repeat every single day. So all of the courses that I've already built, all of the master classes that I have already conducted, all of the things that I say ad nauseum, I just like poured it into the book. I think that did uh, make it easy because like you said, I already have the IP around this. This is stuff I'm already doing. It was just I needed the help and thanks to Alex, who provided it, to organize it in a way that makes sense to the reader. At the time of this recording, you're at a very exciting moment because you're kind of staring at a fork in the road of how the book will get out to the world. So can you also tell us about how you're juggling 
the different options that you have and what might come next, depending on either one. Everybody's asking, when is the book coming out? Are you self-publishing or traditional publishing? And I just say, yes, because I'm at this stage of I have a literary agent, but I've also been working with Alex's company, which is a self-publishing company. So from the very beginning, I was like, I am going to do everything I need to do when it comes to self-publishing. Yes, I have a literary agent and she is pitching my book to traditional publishing companies. But I also understand that traditional publishing takes a really, really, really long time. And as a full-blooded Capricorn, literally, I have no suns, moons, stars, or anything else and anything <laughs> wow. outside of Capricorn. Yeah. Amazing. It's January 7th. It's like rising Capricorn. Wow. So needless to say, I'm a bit of a control freak. Something I'm working on with my own psychic business advisor who I work with as my coach. So I'm at this impasse and I'm just like, I gave my agent a deadline of March 31st. And I said, either I have a deal where I don't. And if I don't, I'll um, pull the trigger on self-publishing. And in fact, all of my ducks are already in a row. And all I have to do is press play on it. And it is go time. So I am currently... I'm currently recording the audiobook version. I put these like dabblings around myself around travel. My family and I are going to France on uh, in a week. And so two weeks before my trip, I'm like, I am going to record the entire book before I go to France because I don't want to have this hanging over me. So that's where I am right now. And it's really exciting. Those are so great because then you do this hard sprint. Well, it doesn't have to be hard. See, you might love recording an audiobook and you have such a blast, but then you get it to immediately have a reward. Go on vacation with your family in France. Yes. And what's better than uh, vacation in France? If you self-publish, would you do that with Alex and team with Get It Done crew? Oh, yes. So I'm already in it with them. When I started working with her, I jumped in and invested in the whole kit and caboodle. So we are the proofreading done, the covers done, the interior layouts done, all of the keyword codes. Like basically everything's done. The last thing is to upload it to, is it Ingram Spark? And to start pre-sales. So you are on fire. I love it. She's the best. I mean, oh, she was one of my favorite people, Alex. And I know she has a whole team of support around her now, but. It's just so fun to get a peek behind the process. And I have other friends who've published with her tiny book course as well, which seems really motivating for anyone who needs a boost. She's so good. And I know she's so calming. Yes. I think part of it is also, right, she's in Hawaii. So there's moments where, you know, over here on the East Coast, I'm having my standard East Coast freak out moment. Then I Voxer message her, and then she gets on with that just, like, soothing, luscious Hawaiian voice. She just walked off the beach, and she's sun-kissed, and she has not a care in the world. And then it gets into you, and you're like, okay, Erin, we can calm down. It's all going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> the last question if you could give business owners permission to do something differently or drop something altogether, what would it be? I would say just drop and outsource everything that you hate doing. Even if you think that you don't have the money to afford it, if there is something in your business that does not bring you joy, stop doing it immediately. Find somebody who loves to do it and who is good at it and pay them. Because even if you think, I don't have the money to pay them, as soon as you open up that space in your life where you're not grudging through it, is that a word? Grudging? I'm just going to make words up now at this point. It is now. Yeah. Okay, it is. I'm going to trademark it. <laughs> My favorite, grudging. Yeah, so good. We grudging, know exactly what it? you mean. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was a feeling. It came from Dave and said, trudging? Yeah, technically it would be trudging through it or trudging. Right? But I love okay. grudging. That just says it all. All of the above. If you're doing that, then you're not 
spending your precious time and energy on the things that are actually going to make you money. So make a list of all the things you hate and immediately outsource them. I just want to add that your entire table of contents is a full set of permission slips. Like you can charge more than your competitors. You can raise your prices. You can lose some clients like over and over. You're just giving us one permission slip after the next. Erin, thank you so much. This has been so fun to chat with you. Where can people find you if they want to keep in touch? People can find me on Instagram at Pricing Overhaul. I'm also on Facebook at Pricing Overhaul by Erin B. Hague. And if you go to my website, pricingoverhaul.com forward slash book, you can enter your name and email address in to receive a free download of the book's introduction, where I tell my rock bottom moment story. And you can download either a PDF copy or the audiobook version. And then you see on my wait list so that you get all of the updates regarding when the book goes into pre order and then when it's officially available and all of the good things. Yay. Last, last thing. Can we close out on the mantra that you share with your daughters every single night when you put them to bed? Oh, yes. Thanks for asking. I have it tattooed on my right shoulder. Also, my back right shoulder. Since the day that they were each born, we say goodnight to them. And we end with, you are kind, you are smart, you are strong, and you are brave. If you've listened this far, you get a gold star. Thank you. Word of mouth is the most joyful way we can grow this show, and it helps us land interviews with the luminaries and insightful guests that you would most love to hear from. Please send this episode to a friend who might find it helpful. And for show notes and related links from this episode, visit itsfreetime.com. While you're there, make sure you're subscribed to the Time Well Spent newsletter. You'll get instant access to my tech toolkit, a continually updated list of all the software I use, along with the total monthly spend to run my business, where no one works full-time, even me. Visit itsfreetime.com slash join. Remember, you are running the show. It's time for radical reimagining, and everything is up for grabs. Let it be easy, let it be fun, and build with love.